Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm Program Manager of Chagas Connected. Uh, you are very welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. Um, this is the 10th in our series of Chagas Connected Signpost webinars, which examine the science, policy, and advice underpinning farm sustainability in Ireland. The series is being delivered in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skill Skillnet. Uh, you can send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available to view afterwards, along with a copy of the presentation on the Chagas website. You can look at all of the previous presentations uh, as well on our, at the Chagas website. So uh, for the month of June, we're going to shift our focus away from greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, and looking at the relationship between agriculture and water quality in Ireland. So today we're joined by Denny, Jenny Deacon, who is manager of the catchment unit with the Environmental Protection Agency. Jenny, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. And we're also joined by Pat Murphy. Pat is uh, head of the Knowledge Transfer Program with uh, Chagisk, uh, the Environmental Knowledge Transfer Program. Pat, you're welcome this morning. Thanks very much, Mark. Any sign, of, any sign of rain down there, Pat? And we got a bit of drizzle about half an hour ago. <laughs> a lot to come. A lot needed, a lot to come, hopefully. It seems to be our, our, our ongoing conversation from week to week. Uh, the, 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 the situation, the water situation in the country, it, it is quite a, getting to a serious situation now. Jenny, could you uh, give us a little bit of background to your own role in the EPA before we uh, start the, the, the main webinar? Sure, Mark. Yeah, I work in the water programme in the Environmental Protection Agency and we're made up of three teams. We have our ecological monitoring and assessment unit that do all the monitoring of all our water courses and lakes and, and estuaries and coasts. We also have a hydrometrics and groundwater team who look at the flows and the levels. Uh, particularly pertinent now, as we're saying, with the, the current drought situation. And then our team, the catchment science team, we do a lot of the kind of integrating of all the data and some of the modeling to support, I suppose, the assessments of what pressures are impacting on water so we can to lead, push that information through into the River Basin Management Plan, which the Minister for Housing, Planning, Local Government is responsible for. Thanks for, for that, Jenny. And Pat, I mean, just in, in relation to the, the water quality, we talk, I talk about the relationship between agriculture and water quality. It has had a, a patchy uh, history in the past. Um, but I think look, there, there is a huge acknowledgement within agriculture that uh, this needs to be addressed and is being addressed. Uh, just could you tell us a little bit of what's happening from a Chagas perspective? Okay, I suppose, yeah, uh, and I think what's happening now is, is I suppose, the Green Deal that was, that's come out in the last couple of weeks has kind of put the challenge really to us. Um, it's trying to get us to reduce our, our nutrient use, but even more so to try and reduce those, those impacts or the impacts of those nutrients through, through better practice. Um, the ASAP service, which is, uh, has been rolled out in the priority areas for action in areas which have been designated for improvement, are working with farmers to try and uh, get them to make some changes on their, their farms to look at the, the risks that are associated with their operations, which vary from place to place, and to take action at, at farm level. A lot of the time, it's, it's, just, it's just simple measures to try and halt that loss of, of nutrient to, uh, to water. And that's, that's I think, going to be the, the big challenge over the, the next uh, couple of years, is trying to understand better how but the nutrients and pesticides and sediment are uh, mobilized into water and trying to uh, reduce that at, at farm level. I think it's fair to say there has been a, a positive response by the farming community to the, the ASSA program, this, this advisory program. Yeah, uh, it, it's been really good. I mean, farmers have been really positive. And I think when you get down to it, and I think one of the key things is, is trying to get understanding there of the, the impact that farming can have. And I think it's, it's kind of accepted now that, that farming does have a, an impact. And once you get that, and once people have an understanding of how what they're doing can impact and how maybe changes can, can help that, well, then I think we're starting to, to, to get some traction there. But I, and I think that's 
I suppose the key of, of the next few, uh, of today's and the next few webinars is to build an understanding of the relationship between what's going on on the farm and what's uh, uh, the impact on, on water quality. And I think with an understanding of, of those dynamics, you can then begin to see how the measures that people are being asked to, to implement actually have an impact. And I think when people understand that, uh, uh, then I think they're, they're more willing to take action. And okay. I suppose it's the first step for farmers understanding, it's the professionals that are working with those farmers who have to really understand uh, those impacts first. And that's, I think, what, what the, the, the water uh, part of this series is about. Great, okay. Well, Jenny, um, are you ready to go with your presentation? I am, yeah. yeah. Great, okay. We'll ask you to share your screen there with us and uh, looking forward to the, your, your presentation. Hopefully this works. Let's have a look. Has that come up, Mark? Yes, yes. Yeah. Looks good. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, water quality in Ireland. Uh, I'm also then going to look at, I suppose, what are the problems that are that we face in Ireland from a water quality perspective. As you've highlighted there, both of you in introduction, nutrients is a big issue for us, but uh, discussions on sediment and uh, other factors are probably one for another day. Then I'm going to look at what are the measures and some challenges and opportunities along the way. So what's the condition of our waters then? Well, our latest water quality in Ireland report was for the period uh, 2013 to 18. So it is integrated all the data from those uh, years and it was published last year. And we present our water quality data in pictorially with five different colors. And I'll be using those colors throughout the session this morning. So high is your the blue color, which is the best quality, followed by green, which is good. So green or blue, good. And then moderate, poor and bad are your yellows, your oranges and your reds. And thankfully, we've only very few reds, which is a good thing. But I suppose what it shows from the picture is that ecological status is quite varied countrywide. That's because there's a multitude of issues. O over half of our water bodies that are in trouble have more than one problem associated with it. And they are widespread. But there's a lot of work to do. When you break it down for each of the water body types, rivers, lakes, estuaries, etc., the top three really are in the greatest trouble, rivers, lakes, and estuaries. Only around half of our rivers and lakes are in satisfactory condition. And our estuaries fare even worse with only uh, 38%. Coastal waters and canals and groundwaters are very good and fairly stable. But unfortunately, we have been seeing ongoing declines, particularly in our rivers. We had a good news story this time around with our lakes, which have come up a bit by 4.3% there, as you can see. But the, the, the uh, large scale challenges for rivers and estuaries and the continuing decline in, in rivers in particular are a concern. This is how the situation has looked over time from back to 2007. And this chart shows the percentage of river bo water bodies at each of the different classes. So you can see in 2007-9 or 2010-12 rather, we were probably at our best in terms of the proportion of high status waters was the highest and the proportion of the, the oranges, the poors were the lowest. But over time, since then, since 2012, when we were at our best, things have started to decline. The high status waters are shrinking proportionally and the moderates and poors are increasing proportionally. The block in the middle is, is relatively stable, a large block, thankfully. Of particular concern is the loss, the ongoing loss of our high status waters. These are really the best of the best and they're really important in terms of recolonizing uh, rivers which have been degraded. This is where the, the best quality waters are. And those have declined over time back to 19, 1987. We had around 500 of the, of the best of the best and we're down to just 20 of those sites now. So what is causing the problems then? What are the, the challenges that we have? Well, this is quite a, a busy looking graph, but if we take it in two parts, the top half is the uh, impacts on good status water bodies. So these are, are kind of your normal water bodies. And you can see there, the chart shows the numbers of water bodies that are impacted by all of those different types of pressures, acidification, chemicals, microbiology, nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. So by far the biggest bar there is nutrients. So for good status water bodies, excess nutrients getting into those waters is the biggest challenge. Followed by morphology, and that, that 
relates to the physical habitat conditions of the river or uh, how the channel uh, is formed, the habitat conditions and sediment in the bed in the stream, for example. So this is the second most important. And as I said earlier, this is probably a discussion for another day because it is becoming apparent that morphology and habitat condition and uh, sediment is really a big challenge we've got to get to grips with. The distribution, I suppose, of the pressures or the, the, the stressors in the high status waters, if we move to the bottom part of the chart, the distribution changes slightly. And in these water bodies, the morphology, uh, the habitat condition is really the most important. And what we found from all our assessments is when we say morphology, in practice, what that means is channel maintenance and channel dredging and channel straightening. That's the biggest impact really on our high status waters, followed then by excess nutrients. So I'm gonna focus on the nutrients today. To some lovely pictures to set the scene. This is what we're aiming for. This is a high status water on the left in County Mayo and a good status water on the right, also in County Mayo. We want more of that and less of this. This is uh, two water bodies, one in Clare, Lake Inchiquin and one in uh, uh, Fingal. Broadmeadow, both of which are impacted by nutrients. So you can see the green algae there, which uh, isn't a very healthy condition. So a closer look at nutrients then. Where do the nutrients come from? So we have a source apportionment model that we use and we look at all the inputs of nutrients in the landscape. And we've got phosphorus on the left there and nitrogen in the middle. And you can see the pie charts divided up. Uh, if we look at the phosphorus graph first, the orange is the wastewater. So urban wastewater for phosphorus sources is quite a large proportion of the pie, the biggest portion of the pie. The, green, uh, the greens and the yellows then are the, the agricultural ones. The darker green is pasture and the yellow is arable and the, the lighter green is uh, forestry. So you can see it's, uh, it's certainly weighted on a national scale towards urban wastewater for phosphorus, but pasture is coming close behind. And the tonnage there, these are, this is uh, slightly out of date figures with, and they're being updated at the moment, but you can see it's quite a, to a tonnage of phosphorus that's been lost into our waters. Nitrogen's a different story though. By far the biggest proportion of uh, nitrogen sources in, in the waters is coming from pasture. And the urban waste water component in the orange there is much smaller. So we can break that down regionally. And, and in fact, we can even go right down to water body scale. We have about 4,000 surface water bodies, so we can go right down to local scale. Essentially, now the two maps show you in a, in a regional sense where those sources of phosphorus and nitrogen are coming from. If we look at the phosphorus map first, and we look in the, the eastern region there around Dublin, the biggest portion of the pie there is urban wastewater, and that's no surprise really. The urban sources are very large point sources, but they tend to be around the coastline where the, the settlements are. And elsewhere then, it's more rural sources of diffuse agricultural phosphorus that are impacting on our waters. In terms of nitrogen though, by far the biggest, as I said, the biggest contributor is the diffuse agricultural sources across all of the, the different regions. Now nitrogen and phosphorus, as most of you probably know, behave very differently in the landscape. And I have two different scenarios here, again, phosphorus on the left and nitrogen on the right. The picture on the left is in County Catchamden, County Louth, and this is a really high risk scenario for losing diffuse agricultural phosphorus. It's poorly draining soils, the overland flow pathway is dominant, and when it rains you just get runoff in, down into nearby farm ditches which flow into streams which flow into the rivers. What we find is nationwide that there's a relatively poor correlation with farm intensity and phosphorus losses and that's because it's really the soils and the runoff on those soils that is the, the greatest factor. It only takes such a tiny amount of phosphorus to run off the land into the waters to cause a, the growth of that algae that you saw in the earlier picture. So the types of measures we need are really sort of insurance measures to break the pathway, break those links, break the overland flow pathway between those fields and the streams. And if we can do that successfully, then the lag time that we might expect before we see the improvement in the water quality is really only days, weeks, months. On the other hand, on the other side then, the nitrogen story is a bit different. This is a, a typical uh, free draining scenario in County Kilkenny, which is high risk for nitrogen loss. And the pathway here is down into groundwater and then into the stream. And there is, for a nitrogen story, a very strong correlation with farm intensity. And so the measures in this instance then are source control. It's about managing your sources of nitrogen in the landscape. 
And the lag times here, when you make your changes, can be months in some circumstances where the pathways are short, but they can increase up to a handful of years. Uh, nothing like what you'd see in other countries where they talk about decades. We're not in that sort of time scale, but it is fair to say it's a few, it could be a few years before you see the full impact of the measures. So we've been able to uh, pull together all our modeling information on our soils and our landscapes and where the source loads are in the, in the landscape from the, the Department of Agriculture data and uh, develop these critical source area maps. These are the hotspots of where we need to, to focus our efforts on the left for phosphorus and on the right for nitrogen. So in both maps, the darker the color, the higher the risk that you're going to lose phosphorus or nitrogen by uh, from diffuse sources of agriculture into your waters. So you can see for phosphorus, there are hotspot areas in kind of North Kerry, Limerick, where the soils are, are pretty poor, and also around Cavan, Monaghan, uh, Leitrim area. So that, that kind of points back to the, the issue I mentioned about the intensity being far less of dominant a factor than the soil type, that those blue colors really follow soil type. On the right then, it's much more or directly linked to farm intensity. And so you can see down Cork, uh, Waterford, Tip, Kilkenny, uh, and the East Coast or the Southeast Coast, there's a lot of uh, dark purple there where we see the highest risk areas and hotspots for nitrogen. And that, I guess, is kind of reflected in the water quality data. These are all the monitoring points we have. Again, I've used the same colors. Blues, are, blues and greens good, and oranges, uh, yellows, and the darker kind of reds and purples, not great. And again, the phosphorus, you can see the cluster of uh, unsatisfactory water quality in the Limerick, North Kerry, Cavan, Monaghan areas, and some in the southeast. And then there's a very clear tr trend in the nitrate concentrations, uh, for all, all focused in the southeast. So let's take a closer look then at each of those uh, scenarios in a, in a regional sense. So if we take nitrogen first, the map shows you where all the, the rivers are that we have the nitrogen data for. And again, the darker the color, the higher the concentration of nitrogen. And in particular, our estuaries down along the south coast, which are very sensitive to nitrogen, are in extreme difficulties. So when we compare then the water quality losses or the emissions in waters, I should say, in those impacted catchments in the southeast, in the red bars, you can see this is the tons of, of nitrogen that makes its way into waters. And you can see, as I mentioned earlier, we were at our best in 2012, kind of uh, 13 time period in the middle of the graph. And since then, we've been uh, increasing. There was a spike in 2018, which was a bit of a concern, probably related to the drought where we had extra dry conditions, more mineralization, and probably a bit of desperation to, to get some nitrogen on to try and get some growth out of the grass when the conditions were so dry. So we need to probably be cognizant of that for 2020, what's ahead of us with the, with the dry times that are here now at the moment. And that chart there in the red contrasts well with the the chart on the left, the blue chart, which is the nitrogen concentrations in the west of the country. So it's about half. Uh, and you can still see this slight increased trend there. And that's because uh, there are still activities, farming activities going on in those areas, but those waters haven't reached the critical point yet. This is the same scenario for phosphorus. We, again, you can see the map. The phosphorus issues from farming are widespread, more related to the soils, less to the farming intensity. And again, if we look at the, the chart on the left, these are the concentrations where we have no water quality problems. The red dashed line is our environmental standard. So in subcatchments where we don't have phosphorus issues, you can see the concentrations are well below that line. Whereas in contrast, the subcatchments where we know we do have phosphorus issues from agriculture, then you can see we're above the line. And also again, we have this increasing trend. So really now we can compile all that information and start to figure out, well, where do we need to target the measures? Can we, can we uh, be a bit more specific about our measures? And this map shows the blue areas where we need uh, phosphorus measures from agriculture and the red areas are where, the orangey areas are where we need uh, measures to reduce nitrogen loss. And as I mentioned earlier, the key thing in the phosphorus situation is breaking the pathway on those poorly draining soils. And on the nitrogen situation, it's more about management of the source. And really our mantra, I suppose, is that we need to get the right measure into the right place. 
So what are the measures then? Well, as you'll all be well familiar, we have our uh, nitrates action program. The fifth program is in preparation at the moment and we've had an interim review, as you know, and there's a, a suite of measures in that that you'll probably all be familiar with, so I'm not going to go into them. But I suppose it needs to, we need to just be cognizant that these measures really are kind of a one size fits all. They represent really a baseline standard that uh, we expect and they can really only go so far as such. You know, and they're not going to be enough on their own to really achieve the targeting that we need to achieve to get the water quality improvements we need. So the River Basin Management Plan, which uh, was talked about earlier, is taking a more targeted approach. And as Pat mentioned, we have now our 190 areas for action where all public bodies are working together to try and achieve water quality improvements. And so th this isn't only agriculture, this is about forestry and septic tanks and urban areas. And it's all public sector bodies working together to try and get those improvements. But um, perhaps what's most exciting is that we have this new ASAP resource that uh, Pat mentioned earlier. We have, <coughs> we have a new farm advisory service that is providing free advice to farmers in these areas for action. They are following up on the basis of local stream walks that the local authorities water program, Law Pro are doing, to find out what are the local problems. And then the idea is that those ASAP advisors work, go and work with farmers to look for solutions that are appropriate for our, that farm. We also now have 12 community water officers also within the, the Law Pro uh, team. And they are uh, busy out in the communities, encouraging communities to get involved in protecting their water uh, courses. So the process in these areas for action, the top line is where it all starts. We have our monitoring data, we figure out what pressures are impacting, we do a bit of modeling where we need to, and this top line really is, is where the EPA uh, has the main responsibility. Moving down then into the second layer, we work together with LawPro to pull in all of the, the local knowledge and understanding from all of the other public bodies who work in the water space. And together we collaboratively use all of our local uh, and national um, information to decide on the significant pressures. There's about 140 different data sets go into that assessment of what pressures are significant in each of our 5,000 water bodies. We also have a collaborative process where together we select areas for action. Some of those would have been selected because, for example, they might be an important amenity area or an important area for fish spawning or uh, an area that had recently declined or perhaps there was a high value, uh, high status water that needed protection or a drinking water protected area, for example. The next step then uh, on the bottom line, so I should say the blue line is led by Law Pro. The bottom line then is where Law Pro and ASAP really come into their own. It's about engaging the community at a local level, building in the knowledge from the local landholders. The Law Pro team do uh, stream walks, and then ASAP work with farmers to co design uh, practice change that are going to achieve the required outcomes. So, we do have some really encouraging early signs of progress in these 190 areas for action. When we had a look at the 2018 uh, data set, while there was an overall national decline in water quality, as I'd mentioned earlier, within the areas for action, there was a net improvement of 16.7%. So that's really encouraging. We've also had a sneak preview of the 2019 uh, data. Now that uh, we don't have full ecological status for that period yet, but uh, from the data that we do have, we can see it looks like there's further improvements again in the 2019 data within the areas for action. So it's really encouraging, I suppose, that, that we're starting to see these improvements and we'll expect more improvements over time as the ASAP and law pro process matures. One of the, the key factors, I think, is that we're focusing all of our public uh, resources into these limited areas to try and address all of the pressures at once. I think that's perhaps been our downfall in the past where we had two scattergun approach. So targeting measures for phosphorus then, what are we, what are we talking about? What, what does that mean? And you'll hear more about that over the next three weeks um, when the other speakers come in. So really for phosphorus, I mentioned that it's about breaking the pathway. So we're talking about riparian zones and buffer strips and you can see on the right there, uh, a, a nice margin there and 
made all the better in the, the bottom photo there, where the margin is also used for biodiversity purposes. Can those margins be managed for biodiversity as well as for water quality? Engineering ditches as well is a, is a relatively new concept being led by uh, Paul Quinn, Newcastle University. And for any of you that were at the Chagas ACP conference last year, Paul gave a lovely presentation on how we can better manage our ditches as mitigation features within the landscape. Can we turn them into a series of ponds where nutrients and sediment will settle out while still letting the water away? Also wetlands are, and re-wetting and blocking drains is also a key uh, local measure. The interesting thing about this is that measures for phosphorus can often also have co-benefits for biodiversity and for trapping sediment and also pathogens, where there's bathing water downstream, for example, or a, or a shellfish water. So really, we, we'd like to see that we, we try and look for, for measures that address more than one thing at once. Targeting measures for nitrogen then, what does that look like? Well, really it's about, as I mentioned, source control. So it's about nutrient management planning. It's about getting your soil fertility right, using protected urea and clover, and ultimately potentially less application of chemical N in some circumstances. Pat mentioned the Green Deal earlier on, and there, there are some quite stringent targets um, and, and objectives coming through in some of those new policies. The interesting thing about targeting measures for nitrogen though is that there are also co-benefits in that instance for ammonia and we're in trouble with our ammonia targets as well and also for our greenhouse gases. So can we choose nitrogen reduction measures that are going to have co-benefits there as well? Now there are a lot of drivers and we've spoken about some of this this morning already. There's the Green Deal, there's the biodiversity strategy, there's the farm to fork strategy, the sustainable development goals. We have the CAP strategic plan being developed at the moment. We have our, our industry led food wise uh, strategy and then we have our, our quality assurance schemes as well. So there's a lot going on in this space and it's very, very challenging to try and uh, get all the messaging aligned. And that I think is one of our major challenges and opportunities is to try and join up that messaging and then follow up that with joined up actions and supports for farmers who need to make the changes. How can we help them? And the ASAP service is doing fantastic work in that regard. So it's, it's, re it's really good approach to actually work with farmers, bring in the farmers local knowledge into the solutions and make sure that they're appropriate for their business goals and their local farm conditions and uh, their local environmental targets. So can we identify and support those measures that can achieve those multiple benefits? And when we say multiple benefits, we're talking about not only water quality, but also air quality, and that's the ammonia targets again, the biodiversity, the greenhouse gases, natural flood mitigation is also another one. Can we hold back the, the water in the landscape? And that will also trap nutrients and sediment. We also have the immunity factor. Everyone likes walking near their, their local beach or stream or lake. And that also brings in the health and well-being as a, a co-benefit. It's going to be really important with the challenges that are ahead of us, I think, that we share our cross-disciplinary knowledge and also our data and also our training. Because as Pat said earlier on, the advisors are the front line in all of this. And there's a huge body of knowledge there that, that needs to be pulled together to try and join up the messaging and work together to try and achieve the outcomes. And the final point there then is about setting targets that are based on outcomes, results-based targets, like the, the Burn Life Project, for example, and the Hen Harrier Scheme. What are we trying to achieve? And can we set targets so that we know whether we're achieving those or not? And can we track progress toward, towards them? And most importantly, can we share the learnings that we're getting and then adapt? Um, so that's about it that I wanted to say. Um, you can find out more about your local stream in terms of its water quality and also the pressures impacting it and also whether or not you're inside an area for action on www.catchments.ie. Thanks, Mark. Jenny, thanks so much for that. That was an excellent overview of the, 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 where we're at with water quality. I mean, it's, it's, um, this targeted approach seems to be a uh, far more, um, how would you call it, effective a, a way of, of tackling water quality. We've been, I suppose, applying general principles uh, before now. Just until you mentioned about the policies, the various different policies that are in place there, Jenny. I mean, there, prob there probably isn't that level of coherence that's needed uh, between the different policies. I mean, is that a, 
a struggle or a frustration for uh, you know agencies like the EPA? Absolutely, Mark. You know, it is it is challenging. It's it's challenging for professionals. It's challenging for government departments. It's challenging for farmers. There's so much going on. So I really think we it, there's a real opportunity for us to come together as uh, public servants with the, the farming community to try and get our heads together to, to align the messaging and make sure that we select measures for all of these different objectives that are synergistic rather than antagonistic because there's no doubt there are some measures you can choose that will tick more than one box so to speak but then there is a risk as well that you know you think you're doing a great thing for biodiversity but actually you're, you're not doing a great thing for water quality you know so it, it's very challenging absolutely and typically you know we all like to work in our silos we're all very good at, at what we're good at and so I think we really need to try and step out of ourselves and come together and try and join up our knowledge and understanding and and collaborate a bit more to try and make this a bit simpler <laughs> and, that, and line ourselves up well that's that that is one of the objectives of the Chagas Connected program is to provide that platform for professionals and anyone uh, with an interest or involvement in ag the agri food sector to to you know be be informed and and that's one of the reasons we're here today um so uh, pat uh, quite a few questions coming through there um and we have uh, yeah uh, and and i suppose uh, a mixture of everything from uh, kind of uh, how do we get involved to some quite technical questions. There's one there just at the beginning, and it's, it's just from, a, a, I think, a, a group representing some ecologists uh, saying, uh, uh, okay, they're aware, I think, of the uh, river basin management plan consultation process that's going on, but how else can they uh, get an input into, into I suppose, the uh, remediation of the issues and get their, their voice across? The first port of call I would say to anyone is your local community water officer. There's 12 of those and you can find out who they are and, and get their contact details on the Law Pro website, which is watersandcommunities.ie. And they can provide you with contacts with your local uh, catchment uh, stream walking staff and they can also point you towards community schemes if that's what you're interested in to try and do some uh, mitigation. We have a community water fund, for example, where community groups can apply to, to do a little project on their local stream. So there's, there's an awful lot going on and I would say definitely the community water officers are a good first place to start. Okay, uh, just a couple of, I suppose, more uh, uh, technical ones then. Uh, question there uh, in relation to uh, the drought in, in 2018. Uh, I think you m m might have alluded to it. Uh, did the drought in 2018 skew the water quality data in your view? I would think we probably did have some challenges in the very uh, headwaters and you could see that coming through on the graph where I pointed out the issues. Hydrology is an issue in those tiny headwater streams. But as, it, as you come out of those headwater streams and you move down into the larger streams, then there was sufficient water uh, in those to actually keep some wetted habitat there. Rising temperatures are an issue. There's no doubt when water gets warmer, the ecology starts to struggle. Um, so, and, and again, there would have been less dilution. Uh, and on top of the less dilution, then you also had the increase in mineralization and, and uh, obviously the urban discharges weren't decreasing any either. So it's a multiple, a multitude of challenges in a dry year from the source side and also then from the, the receptor side. Jenny, just and while- I think, uh, sorry, go on, Mark. We're, we're it would be wrong uh, not to mention, I mean, so we're talking about water quality today to mention water quantity. Uh, is that something the EPA is looking at uh, in terms of our, I suppose, reserves and uh, the ability to, to um, I suppose, service all parts of society, including agriculture? Absolutely. Uh, we have, um, as you know, we're responsible for the, uh, the abstraction licensing regime. Um, which is yet to be developed. So there's that side of it. And Irish Water are very concerned about their reserves at the moment. I understand they're, they're looking at restrictions fairly shortly. Um, in terms of what's going on actually out in the landscape, I mentioned at the start that uh, our, my colleagues within the water program do measure flows and levels. We have a hydrometrics team and people can find out what the flows are like in their local stream on our Hydronet uh, website. So we will be producing uh, a monthly bulletin 
uh, throughout the summer as to how the, the water levels are going. I suppose in summary, we are drier now at this time of the summer than we were in 2018. So it is a concern and we do need rain quickly. And I mean, are there any long-term strategies that the EPA is contemplating to, to address this or the, the Ireland as a whole that should be considering? Certainly the main agency who are, are looking at these kind of strategies for this would be Irish Water. You know, they have a real concern about the security of the drinking water supplies and how those are managed. So they would be the leaders probably in this regard, to be fair. And they have a lot of modelling and, and forecasting uh, involved in those assessments. And that's ongoing. Ms. Jenny, uh, kind of this, this, this probably isn't a simple question, but uh, from Gáinne or Hurley, uh, how strong is the, the correlation uh, between nitrogen loss and stocking rate intensity, and then just a corollary, is it uh, dependent on grass utilization and grass grassland management? I think the you're probably straying in now to a topic that's going to be covered next week by Carl Richard. So I, I'm not going to get too involved in that, but I suppose just to, to say, yes, we can definitely see a correlation for nitrogen between stocking rate and nitrogen emissions but there are other factors in the mix there the soil type is really important because those freely draining soils the more freely draining the soil the better the relationship because when you get a poorly draining soil you get some degree of denitrification and so the relationship breaks down a bit so so there's a lot of factors in there the soils is one but also with your increased stocking rate comes an increased use of uh, fertilizer, increased use of chemical fertilizer. So the whole system kind of ramps up and, and it also tends to be that when you have your more intensive systems, they only work on the better soils. So it's a kind of a perfect storm, I suppose, more freely draining soils, more intensity, more fertilizer use, and then ultimately uh, less dilution as well, as you can see. There's a, but I didn't mention as I put up the map at the start, we have our highest nitrogen concentrations in the southeast, but that's also the driest part of the country because we get less dilution from less rainfall as well. So rainfall is also a very key factor in the mix there. But I suppose to cut, <laughs> to cut a very uh, difficult uh, story short, yes, there is a relationship between stock and rate and emissions. Okay, I have a cluster of questions here around the whole community engagement piece. One, how does it work? Uh, another relating to the possible role for river trusts. Uh, and then just a, a, a question about how do we get best, uh, I suppose, environmental benefit from that community engagement? Uh, you alluded to it, I think, during your presentation, but maybe to expand a little on it. That's right. So we have our, our, our 12 community water officers and I, they're a fairly recent addition to the overall Water Ireland project, if you like. And, and it really, they came about in recognition that getting public participation and managing water resources and really trying to engender the hearts and minds of local communities to, to get involved with their local water course was a critical factor underpinning the success of the whole uh, water management strategy and that's reflected in the water framework directive as well and Ireland it was recognized need to step up in that regard so hence we now have our new law pro team which is the community water officers and the catchment scientists so those community water officers are doing Trojan work out with community groups on the ground uh, that's your first port call as I mentioned to, to actually get engaged and and they have various funding schemes and they can help community groups come together and do cleanups or or take on bigger projects um, what was the second part of the question Pat I, I know there was a, a piece about the potential role of river trusts oh river trust yes we are in the fortunate position now where in the last few years we have some new rivers trusts that are getting up and going and it's great to see two in particular have been funded now uh, under the the WFD program one in the Meg catchment which is uh, largely in County Limerick and one up in Donegal the Inish Owen Rivers Trusts and those Rivers Trusts it, it, it's a very successful model that the UK uses for example and they're just really fledgling now in Ireland but they have the real potential that they're embedded in the communities they're made up of um, local people and they can take on local issues and really try to drive them on so it's going to be really exciting in the next few years now that this recent funding was an, it was announced for the Meg Trust and the Inishon Trust mm -hmm. to see how they can uh, progress and uh, and how we can support them. Jenny, we have um, a question here in relation to um, 
uh, results-based payment schemes, uh, biodiversity and water quality, are integrated in the results-based uh, scheme designed as part of the Pearl Muscle EIP. Uh, what are your thoughts, Jenny, on the potential of Orbi? Yes, to deliver uh, co-benefits for water quality and biodiversity. And I suppose this question is particularly Im important in the context of the, the upcoming cap as well. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, uh, eyes looking at these types of schemes for future cap. Absolutely. I think these are a fantastic innovation. And you mentioned a couple of them there, the Pearl Muscle one. There's one for Hen Harriers as well. And also there's a, there's a fund that, that DAFRAM support, the European Innovation Program, the EIP projects. And every year there's a call out for new ones of those as well. And those are looking at a, a wide range of issues. I think these are the way of the future, really. It's a, it, it kind of it engenders the whole bottom up approach, you know, getting communities involved to be to be part of and to design themselves the solution for their local issues and then to support them by giving them get letting them get payments for the outcomes that they achieve it's also a principle that's firmly embedded in the new cap strategy that we try and work more towards result based or outcome based uh, support schemes uh, as well as activity based schemes and I, I think that was part of the design actually of the the burren results based uh, program where at the start they encouraged the activities to get people up and going and you were getting payments on the basis of what you did. But then over time, gradually, they were able to shift towards payments for the outcomes of what you achieved. So I think these are a fantastic mechanism, particularly because they are bottom up, as I say, they're community led and they're a perfect opportunity to consider all of the different co-benefits at once in the local area. I understand there's going to be uh, fairly substantial life funding available as well in the next round of CAP as well. So that's something that people should be aware of, I think. Absolutely. The Department of Housing, Planning, Local Government has just secured a, a Waters of Life project, which is 20 million euros, part funded by the Commission and part funded by uh, Irish um, resources. And that the purpose of that project is to look at high status waters and how can we better protect those. There's also a National Parks and Wildlife led life project that's just about to commence as well about rest, restoring bogs and that rewetting organic soils, which obviously has a big benefit for carbon as well as for water quality and for biodiversity. So these, and I should say there's existing life projects actually ongoing at the moment. We're just coming to the end of the Kerry Life project, which is about the pearl mussel in Kerry. Um, and then there's an aloe life project as well, which has various strands to it too. So they're a real useful source, <coughs> excuse me, um, of a large amount of money from the commission and, and supported by Ireland at once to address a problem. They're not a long-term solution because usually they're project-based and they're a few years, but they can give you a real injection of funds to, to really get to grips with an issue and get learnings out of it that you can then embed in your kind of national strategies. That's lots more questions coming through there. Yeah, I was just having some trouble. There, I think there's one thing that uh, I suppose just needs to clarify. The, there's a question there. You mentioned wastewater has been the main uh, uh, source of, of phosphorus pollution, yet you're, in your presentation you're concentrating on agriculture, never once mentioned urban uh, and, and the policy in relation to urban. Uh, and I think I should probably just say that, I mean, we really asked Jenny to deal with the agricultural issue. And, and you did mention, I think, early on, that uh, the approach we're taking with LawPro is looking at all aspects uh, uh, in relation to water quality. And that's, I suppose, one of the things we're, we're trying to do is make sure that we're not pointing fingers here, but we're trying to resolve all elements of the solution. Maybe you have a comment on that, because there's a couple of questions in that, in that sphere, if you want. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned at the start when I put up all those pie charts that, yes, the, the load, if you like, of phosphorus is dominated by the load from people but the locations of those points where of the pipes essentially where that phosphorus comes in is largely around the coast so it's Cork, Limerick, Galway and Dublin would be the main hotspots for most of that load. So the load from people within the rural landscape is small relative to the load from agriculture so I suppose there's a bit of a nuance there about where the load actually comes from spatially as well as at a national scale. I also then mentioned the, very briefly, touched on it, that the, the beauty of the areas for action process is that we've learned that 
all, more than half of our water bodies have more than one problem. You know, it's not just all about agriculture. It's not just all about forestry. There's a, usually a mix of issues. And the beauty about the area for action process is that Law Pro are engaging with all of the relevant implementing bodies to address all of those issues at once. So where there is a septic tank that's causing a problem, they engage with the landholder and they get that sorted. Where there's a forestry issue, they engage with the forestry service and wheelchair and they get that sorted. So I focus today, you're right, Pat, I focus today on the, on the agriculture side, uh, given the topic, but, uh, but that's not to say that urban waste water is being forgotten about. There's a, a very large uh, Irish water capital investment program going on. Uh, we would say that it's not happening fast enough, uh, definitely, um, and there's always uh, improvements that can be made there, but it is fair to say that while we do have discharges around the country of untreated wa waste, they are largely on the coast and they are, there is a program in place to address it. The challenge really is the inland stuff, the more diffuse sources of uh, nutrients that come uh, and impact on the local streams and the local ditches. Okay, thanks for that. Um, there's a, a, a couple of questions there. One is just, I suppose, asking the blunt questions. Will straight uh, reductions in uh, allowed chemical uh, use resolve our issues? Now, again, this is probably a question for Carl next week, <laughs> rather than me. Uh, you know, our, our work really takes us as far as understanding what the pressures are in our waters. And we have enough information to say it's agriculture. And now we're starting to break down the messaging to end messaging and P messaging. When it comes to actually what can be done on farm, that's going to need uh, a few more heads in the, in the room to address. Essentially, we don't know yet. Is it is it going to be doable with just efficiencies? What what is the scale? This is a piece of work actually. We're just starting, is to try and look at where we have impacted uh, rivers and estuaries, where they're impacted by nitrogen. What scale of nitrogen reduction do we need to achieve our environmental targets? We've never really actually said that out loud before. How much nitrogen in kilos per hectare do we need to reduce by? So we're working through that at the moment. We've just got some recent. Um, up-to-date land use information from DAFM and we're pulling that together with our models and tools to try and uh, work that out. So we'll be able to do that. We'll be able to say how much reduction is needed in term, in tons. But then the big question is, well, how can we achieve that? What does that mean? Do, can that be achieved by just further efficiencies on farm? Can it by, be achieved by by bringing in the clover? Can it be achieved by better soil fertility or nutrient management planning? Or are we at the point where we need some reduction in chemical N? And I think all options are on the table, but that's a discussion we've yet to have. And we'll be led by the, the Chagas uh, advice when it comes to that. Jenny, what yes, sort well, of... Uh, yeah, sorry. Go I just wanted to get a, an idea, Jenny, of the timelines that we're operating to here. Uh, we're in the, the river basing planning process. Um, you know, what, what sort of targets are expected of Ireland and, and, and what are the consequences if we don't hit those targets? I suppose particularly in the consequence of, I suppose the nitrates derogation is probably the main one that uh, is, is, is important for agriculture. Absolutely, Mark. It is, it is an issue, but we're not the only country struggling with this issue. And to be fair, we have, uh, we have a head start at the starting line because compared to other countries, we're not as bad as some. Germany, for example, only has 8% of their water bodies that are at satisfactory condition. So they have a long way to go as well. So under the Water Framework Directive, we are all member states supposed to have all our water bodies in satisfactory condition by 2027. Now that is an enormous task. And to be honest, no amount of money that you could throw at that would actually solve that problem in that time frame. Um, so Ireland's strategy is to is to bite off a, a manageable portion that we can that we can achieve. We have our our national measures, we have our action plan and our nitrates action plan. That's tightening up all the time. You know, we had the interim review a, a year or so ago, and we're straight into the fifth nap now. And and really, you know, the the Jack Nolan mentioned it in his presentation a few weeks ago. The department's challenge really is to demonstrate that Ireland's going in the right direction. And we can see that within the areas for action, which is really positive. We definitely need to step up our game. Every, everyone knows that, and I think everyone accepts that. And this is a great opportunity, this webinar series, to really start the process of us all getting our heads together to really tackle this head on. We have a lot of work to do. 
the consequences, you know, in theory, we can be, and we potentially will be fined for not achieving our targets by 2027. But as I say, all member states are struggling with this. And our priority really, I think, is to demonstrate that we are taking this seriously, that we're we're putting measures in place that we're learning from what we're doing and that the trends are starting to turn and that we're going in the right direction. And okay, if that takes a, a, a bit of time, well then so be it. We definitely need to step up the speed because you know, the, the biodiversity is only just hanging on. We, we don't have time to waste. Uh, things are getting tighter and tighter all the time, particularly with the, ch the climate change challenges that we have. So we all, I think would appreciate, we all have to up our game. Um, and make sure that we're heading in the right direction. Okay, Pat. Yeah, I suppose there's a, a couple of uh, uh, questions about uh, uh, Law Pro and the uh, information coming uh, from the river assessments. I, uh, do you know if those are going to be made available? That the the uh, detailed studies are are they internal? And I suppose a couple of other questions. Uh, one about the I suppose that myriad of, of uh, organizations and bodies dealing with, with water quality, quality, is that leading to confusion or are people beginning to get their heads around it? So the law pro process is still, still kind of maturing. The, the teams have really, this is only really their second summer being out and about, and this is obviously, they've obviously been curtailed with the, the COVID situation. So, so there's a lot of work going on. My understanding is that the intention is to, to publish implementation reports when they get to that stage. There are none of those uh, ready as yet because there's still a lot of work going on. But, but yes, the intention is, and, and it's fair to say the intention with all of the activities going on under the, the River Basin Management Plan is to make it all as public as possible. And that's why we have that catchments.ie website that I mentioned earlier, where you can go on and find out the most up-to-date information about not only water quality, but the pressures and the measures and also the community groups, uh, the stories, the, the projects, everything that's going on in the water space is up on the catchments.ie website. Um, the second question, Pat, I, I'm afraid has escaped me again. What was the second question? Uh, I'm gone stupid. I'll, I'll, I'll just move on. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. There's a, an interesting question here. Has the, the method of assessment of water quality uh, changed in any way over the years or is there more sensitive testing? Uh, uh, I think I know where that question is coming from. Okay, so uh, we are very fortunate and somewhat unique <coughs> in Europe at having a 30-year monitoring program for the Q value, which is the assessment of the ecology in the rivers. So the, the biology teams within the EPA, the ecology teams go and they have a look at the ecology in the rivers. And the ecology, so when I say ecology, I mean the habitat conditions and the bugs and the fish and, and the living things within the water. And that assessment, which we call the Q value, gives you a more integrated and rounded assessment of what's going on in, in terms of water quality, rather than we'll say, dipping a bottle in and taking a sample, a, a snapshot sample of a nitrogen concentration or a phosphorus concentration. So that rounded, integrated ecological assessment process has been in place in Ireland for well over 30 years. It must be getting on for 40, actually. I need to update my, my numbers. Um, and so we have a long history and that Q value really is the backbone of our river uh, monitoring program. And that's the dominant factor in the ecological status assessment because it's the biological integrated elements and all of the other things like the chemistry and the, um, the chemical pollutants and uh, the fish, they're all supporting elements uh, to, to that ecological assessment. So it is a long-term assessment. Yes, we do uh, tweak, particularly um, what's new is the, our understanding of the hydromorphological pressures. And I mentioned that a bit at the start and then promptly said I wouldn't talk about it. The hydromorphology is, is a relatively new thing. It's about the physical habitat conditions. So is there enough flow? Is, is there too much fine sediment? Is the river connected to its floodplain? Does the river meander like it's supposed to? Does the river actually function like a proper river or have we modified it, constrained it between uh, concrete walls or have we drained and dredged it and, and therefore it's, it's disconnected from its place in the landscape? So our tools are evolving in that hydromorphology space. But as I say, it is only a supporting element to that uh, more integrated ecological assessment, which has been constant for the last 30 years.
And you mentioned uh, sediment there in your, your comment just there. Uh, how big an issue is that in this country? I know certain parts of England, erosion, soil erosion is a really big problem. Um, how, how important is that uh, as towards uh, river pollution, I suppose, is the, the main receptor for, for, for sediment? Absolutely. And also lakes, actually, because lakes, the sediment yeah. can get into the lakes and, and just fill it up. And, and the trick with the tricky bit with sediment is not only is it a is it a physical problem in that it blocks the, the spaces and the habitat conditions physically, but it also tends to bring with it chemicals and nutrients that are bound to the sediment that over time in a lake, for example, then can can uh, release in a longer uh, time period. So it's a double edged sword, really, um, physically and uh, chemically. So, yes, all the recent research is emerging that sediment is a really important stressor in the ecological environment. And there's a lot of new work coming on board with that. We don't have a national sediment monitoring program. We do, when we go out and do our ecological assessments, we would take a kind of a visual estimate of what the sediment is like, but we don't have a national program as such. So we don't know the full extent of it. But what we can see is that where there are detailed studies done, like the ACP, for example, like the, the high status waters projects, where you do have better information, we can see, particularly in the high status waters, that the sediment is a real issue and it's actually the dominant issue in those high status waters. So it's something we're going to have to get to grips with um, as we move forward. Absolutely. And I think just a, a comment on that, the, the experience from both the law pro teams and, and the asset teams going out are, I think one of the things they have found over their first year is that sediment is a bigger proportion of the problem than they would have expected. So yeah. I think that's, that's a, a reiterates I think the point you're you're making the point that's coming from some of the recent science absolutely and the question is where does it come from and in the Irish you know in, in the UK context it's probably more coming from the arable runoff and that would be your typical kind of textbook source of, of sediment but what we find in the Irish context is that it's coming from draining and dredging lands it's nearly it's nearly a vicious cycle you know you drain and you dredge and that weakens the banks and it deepens the channel which slows the flow which then collects more sediment which means you have to more dredge and drain more and it's a vicious cycle and it just moves on and on downstream so the, the measures that that are likely to, going to be needed in the future are about slowing the flow and keeping the flow in the landscape which means we then will need to drain and dredge less and then we'll hopefully break that cycle just, just on that, Jenny, the, I mean, the idea, the concept of using managed uh, riparian woodlands as a, a means of, I suppose, uh, intercepting that uh, adjacent to water bodies is, is a question here we have, actually. It's, um, what, you, what, what is your, your view on that as a, a way of mitigating runoff and uh, flooding, flooding and uh, potentially Absolutely. cooling the temperature as well uh, around uh, water bodies? There's a lot of win-wins with uh, particularly native woodland uh, in riparian areas where it's suitable. It's not it, the Forest Service have a mantra as well, the right tree in the right place. So, yeah, there are multiple benefits with uh, with native woodlands in riparian areas. It's a uh, it provides a, a break the pathway tool. As you say, it prevent it provides shade. It cools. It's a food source in the stream. Uh, the agroforestry schemes that are there at the moment are, are particularly interesting where you can do a bit of grazing under the trees as well. Um, so I, I think one of the major benefits in, the, in, in considering that as an option is that the schemes that the Forest Service run are funded. So there are payments associated with putting those trees in down to quite small uh, hectares, actually. So there is a viable option where you have to um, try and break a pathway in, in one of those critical source areas. It's a really exciting option, actually. There's, there's a question here uh, uh, in relation to, uh, say, the loss of, of pea from whatever source, be it slurry or whatever, when there's high uh, water uh, movement. Uh, and I suppose the, the corollary, obviously, of the question is, well, are there different impacts of pea loss at different points of the year in different conditions? Uh, and how important is that? Absolutely. I, I mentioned earlier that overland flow and soil type are the key, the key uh, mechanisms. So 
we we are able now to to pull out these critical source areas as they're called these hotspot areas and, and indeed farmers would know them themselves that you know the wet corner at the bottom of the field there that just never seems to dry out those are the hotspot areas and the wetter they are the more likely the phosphorus is to run off some of those areas do dry out at parts of the year and those are the times to maybe to graze them but when they get a bit wetter then uh, it, it's better as an option to try and keep the sources of, of nutrients off those. So it, it is a challenge, it's dynamic. You know, I do talk about the right measure at the right place, but actually it, it really should be the right measure in the right place at the right time. Okay. Jenny and Pat, we're, we're yeah. run out of time, can you believe it? I don't know where that hour went. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, uh, thank you so much for excellent presentation and uh, you've got some tough questions there. So yeah. you, thank you for your really frank responses to those. Mark, just a comment. I think we might try and hold on to some of the questions because uh, yeah. some of the questions are probably more related to issues that will be coming up over the next uh, few weeks. So I think it's a, we'll, we'll try and hold on to those and, and maybe ask them to the, the people who are following on who are dealing with some of the, I suppose, the specific science about some of the dynamics of, of uh, uh, nutrients, etc. So there's a, a good number of questions about that. So thanks, yeah, thanks Jenny. Thank you. So look, I, I want to thank, thank you again, Jenny. Uh, Pat, thank you for uh, helping with the, the questions today and obviously your coordination of, of this series. Uh, also Andy Boland, uh, who is uh, coordinator of the, the, the series and Yvonne Maher, uh, who's part of our production team as well. Um, thank, you, thank you all to our partner, also to our partners uh, who are supporting this uh, webinar series. And thank you. Uh, our, our audience for, for listening and your engagement. Um, we had a record attendance today at our, our webinar. Um, over 300 uh, people attended um, and lots and lots of questions. So um, Jenny must be the, the, the Jenny's Jenny pulling part. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, I just want to remind you that next week's webinar uh, will be joined by Carl Richards, who's going to be talking about the interactions uh, with uh, nitrogen and soil between soil and water, particularly in the context of, of uh, nitrogen and understanding uh, those interactions. So, uh, with that, I want to thank you for your your attention this morning and uh, remind you that the recording of today's uh, webinar will be available uh, on the Chagas uh, YouTube channel. Uh, the presentation, uh, Jenny's presentation, also will be available on the Chagas website. So. Uh, thank you again and enjoy the rest of the weekend and hopefully a little bit of rain will fall wherever you are in the country in the, over the coming days. So thanks again.